that's okay. I think we're just about ready to start. Um, so first of all, welcome. Uh, I'm Zoe. I'm an events executive at Brand Finance. Thank you for joining our webinar from the Brand Finance Institute, the educational and training division of Brand Finance, which offers world-class executive training on brand strategy and valuation. Today we are pleased to be joined by almost 100 people from over 10 different countries um, and uh, we'll be focusing today on the impact of COVID-19 um, it's having on sports business and how sports brands are navigating through the crisis. The online discussion will be led by Declan Ahern, uh, Valuation Director and Hugo Hensley, Senior Consultant at Brown Finance, who I'll hand over to very shortly. Just a quick note on housekeeping, the format of the hour-long webinar today will follow a 30 to 40 minute presentation by Declan and Hugo, followed by a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session. Um, all questions um, and any other comments can be submitted through to our presenters directly through the Q&A facility. Um, just to let you know, we will be sharing a recording of the web webinar after the session. Um, we also kind of request that on leaving the webinar, you fill out a very brief survey providing feedback that will help um, be helpful to develop our future webinars in the series. Um, finally, I'd like to encourage you all to engage with us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter using the hashtag uh, BFI webinar and the brand finance handle on Twitter um, at brand finance. Um, without further ado, I'm now very pleased to hand over to Declan and Hugo for the presentation. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you very much, Zoe. Uh, and just to reiterate Zoe's comments there, good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to this webinar. Um, as Zoe mentioned, and I'm, I'm told, we have attendees from uh, Sri Lanka, Romania, India, Spain, Portugal, uh, the USA, the UK, among other countries. So again, a warm welcome. Uh, my name is Declan. I am a valuations director at Brown Finance, and my colleague Hugo is a senior consultant, and we are part of the team that produce our annual football valuations and report each year, which I think some of you may be aware of. Uh, and we also more broadly work within the sports consulting sector at Brown Finance. So just to give you a quick run through the agenda, uh, Hugo and I will be touching on the business of sport and, and laying the land of how the finances within the industry actually work. We'll then move on to how sports clubs and organizations are addressing the disruption from the onset of COVID-19, uh, followed by a European football financial case study and brand value impacts on teams and actual clubs. We'll then touch on the implications for corporate brands and partner brands. Uh, before giving uh, a lay of what we think the future holds, uh, as well as some recommendations. We'll then jump into Q&A, and just to remind everyone that uh, there should be a button on screen, a little Q&A button on, on your Zoom page. Uh, feel free at any point just to, to drop your questions in there, and we will try and address them at the end of the presentation. So just to set the scene for today's webinar, we thought it'd be useful to give an overview into the business of sport and how finances work within the industry. So uh, the sports industry is estimated to be worth over uh, 500 billion US dollars. Um, and as well as the economic benefits that everyone I think is aware of, sport has other non-economic benefits such as societal cohesion and, and development. So it's an extremely important industry which has been impacted um, quite significantly by the onset of COVID-19. In fact, sport as an industry is so large that if it were a country, it would be the 24th uh, largest country in the world by GDP, about the size of Sweden. Uh, so if anyone had any doubts about how important the industry is worldwide, there you go. So how does the sports industry actually make money? Um, and what we're gonna look at first is sporting teams or franchises. And essentially there are three sources of income for most teams. So the first is match day, uh, the second is broadcasting, and the third is commercial revenue. What we have done here is include uh, some figures from Manchester United, who I think everyone should be aware of. And as we can see, if you look at uh, match day income in red, it accounts for approximately 18% of Manchester United's total income. Um, so that's selling tickets as well as merchandising from their mega store. And in terms of, of the impact of COVID, Man United alone has 3,000 matchday staff on payroll that they need to pay and are currently not working. Um, but we'll touch a little bit more on that a, a bit later. The second stream is broadcasting, which is 
typically negotiated uh, across leagues at a league level and then redistributed to clubs and teams um, and other leagues below that. And the third revenue stream is commercial revenue. Um, and that's really an opportunity where the brand has an area to work and grow revenue significantly for the team. And that's done through sponsorship and commercial agreements. So now we look at the other side of the coin and that is uh, how corporate sponsors benefit from the sports industries and how they make money within the industry. So if we look at a brand like Adidas, for example, there are a few benefits that they are seeking when undertaking a sponsorship agreement. So the first would be to simply increase brand awareness um, across all their stakeholders. That should theoretically then lead to uh, improved brand equity perceptions around the brand. Uh, so the image attributes, um, things like brand consideration and preference, which would then lead to higher merchandise sales. So if you think about the amount of uh, shirts and merchandise that is sold, on the back of Adidas's agreement with Manchester United. It's, it's a huge volume for Adidas. There are other secondary and tertiary benefits around a sponsorship, things like corporate hospitality and driving B2B relationships, the ability to conduct targeted marketing activities on consumers, uh, relatively strong return on investment as opposed to other marketing activities or, or brand campaigns, and things like community goodwill in the area that these brands operate in. However, I think the overwhelming thing to remember is that these sponsorship agreements are undertaken for one single purpose, and that is ultimately to make money for these corporate brands. So how do these corporate brands benefit from, from sports sponsorships? Uh, well, what we've done is we've, we've taken a case study from a, a previous client, and you can see on the left-hand side of your screens here, uh, the uh, in a, a green line represents those who are unaware of the sponsorship agreement that was taking place. And the outer blue line represents those people who were aware of the sponsorships, the sponsorship agreement that was in place. And as you can see, all of these brand perceptions have improved as a result of the sponsorship. So what that then leads to is a change in consumer behaviors and that change in consumer behaviors drives revenue and drives profits for the corporate brand. So ultimately, we see an increase in both brand value and business value for corporate clients as a direct result of undertaking sponsorship activities. I'm now going to hand over to Hugo to discuss the reaction of various stakeholders within the industry to the onset of COVID-19. Thanks and hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to walk us through a few anecdotes from around the sporting world, just highlighting how different stakeholders, um, including leagues, clubs, sponsors, broadcasters, have reacted and adapted through the disruption. So first, here's a graph I think we're all probably a bit too familiar with now. This is looking at the timeline from um, the end of January to the end of April. And what we can see here is this is information from BBC Sport on sporting disruptions and cancellations. So from this view, um, there are a lot of complaints at the time, but it actually looks like the, the sporting world caught it just in time. Um, with the Olympics, one of the, uh, one of the last to make a statement finally postponing to 2021 on the um, 24th of, of March. So how have um, different stakeholders reacted? Well, one of the fastest responses to the disruption was from La Liga and their title sponsor Santander, who put on the La Liga Santander Fest, which was a charity festival involving over 30 top artists, broadcast on over 100 platforms to 182 countries, drawing in 50 million viewers um, to raise over a million euros. Um, uh, so that was one of the, the fastest responses and it also allowed their partners to um, pick up on some of that missed exposure while the whole of La Liga and sports around the world was um, grinding to a halt. Um, next was the Mercedes F1 team who were able to answer the UK government's call for all industries to help produce critical hospital equipment. Um, nicknamed Project Pit Lane, uh, they mobilised the engineering and technological ability of um, the UK's seven um, teams based in the UK um, to assist with the manufacturer. Um, 
and obviously the positive connections uh, with high-tech innovation that this brings to Mercedes F1 team will have knock-on effects for partners associating with the brand for exactly this reason. So some of those could be um, uh, industrial, such as Ineos and Petronas, but also consumer brands such as Bose and uh, Epson. Um, then it was the turn of the Belarus League, uh, which might manage to briefly draw the attention of many avid football fans who craved a fix of football in action following the closure of their uh, respective local leagues. Um, typically low profile European League attracted broadcasting deals from 10 countries, um, including Israel, India and Russia. Um, and also online sports betting saw uh, a huge increase on the league from international markets. This shows the uh, relative interest through Google search volumes for the uh, Belarusian Premier League over the last five years, um, which I think highlights that pretty clearly. Um, moving on to another stakeholder, the broadcaster. In Australia, a clash between um, the broadcaster channel line and the league led to uh, the imaginative solution to uh, take the whole league onto a, an island to create a, a protective bubble. Um, after Channel 9 criticized the cost structure of the league um, and its ability to be financially stable uh, during this time and publicly announced that they would, they would be um, saving 130 million Australian dollars if the season was cancelled. Um, fortunately for sport, it didn't come to this and the season got moving again in May. Uh, Barcelona showed their support um, by giving over the naming rights uh, to the famous Nou Camp for the first time. Uh, initially, rumours swirled of uh, Mike Tyson's cannabis company taking on the sponsorship, uh, but I think maybe we're more likely to expect maybe a, a local sponsor in this first year or a, a big international involvement. Um, but having been announced in April, there's been no movement so far, and it suggests that um, this uh, huge new property is maybe too big an ask uh, for any sponsors to take on now uh, without any fans actually in the stadium. Um, as was the case with Barcelona's first shirt charity sponsorship from UNICEF, this could ultimately uh, be a move to ease the passionate Barcelona fans into the idea of lucrative stadium naming um, in the future, but uh, maybe that's just the skeptics view. Uh, Esports took on a, a new burst of acceleration, um, already seeing huge growth, but um, uh, sporting events teams and competitions have all looked to create additional content, um, driving viewership, maintaining relevance um, during lockdown. Um, and as everyone's noticed, it's the perfect, uh, the perfect escape when everyone's locked, uh, locked at home um, or in isolation. Uh, F1 had a virtual Grand Prix um, broadcast on ESPN, drawing 30 million viewers. Um, what you see here is the Premier League's uh, invitational FIFA 20 tournament uh, with players getting involved, helping, helping clubs to sort of bridge that, that gap in, uh, online, uh, on, in um, live games um, through, through eSports. However, uh, as we see here from Brand Finance's uh, football research this year, the UK still has a long way to go to catch up with, um, with other countries in terms of football fans being actively players of esports games. So between the ages of 25 and 34, uh, the UK has half as many football fans who've played games as the US and uh, even fewer than China again. So in June, we saw a lot of the return of sports. Um, interesting moves from clubs, leagues to uh, maintain fan involvement. Uh, I think we're probably all familiar with these cardboard cutouts filling stadiums. Um, some interesting ones I think I've seen were people putting their dogs onto the cutouts and uh, Joe Exotic, the imprisoned star of Tiger King, appearing I think at a few stadiums around the world. Um, elsewhere, um, it was estimated that ESPN would lose $480 million in advertising revenue alone if the NBA uh, opted not to complete the season. Um, so it ended up at their parents' house, uh, Disney World. Um, where the NBA is expected to return in a Disney bubble um, in Orlando, Florida. So next we're going to look a little bit more specifically at how coronavirus has disrupted clubs, financials and brand value in the European football landscape. 
Thanks, Hugo. Uh, so just to illustrate the financial impact of COVID-19 um, in, in the sports industry, we're going to focus a bit on football clubs based in Europe uh, and the potential implications on, on brand value and, and business value for those clubs. And the reason for the focus on football is twofold. So firstly, the former Pope thinks it's a good idea. Uh, he was quoted as saying, amongst all unimportant subjects in the world, football is by far the most important. And secondly, generally the data and reporting amongst European football clubs is extremely robust, which allows us to do some interesting analysis. So what we have here on screen is a distribution of the total revenues earned in European football from the 2018 season. And as you can see, the majority of revenue is generated through uh, domestic broadcasting deals, which is followed by uh, transfers, then sponsorship and merchandising, gate receipts, and other secondary revenue sources. So I'm not going to hand back to Hugo to talk you through some of these numbers in greater detail. Thanks. So there's a quick overview of how these um have been affected on the surface by COVID-19. We can see that um, domestic broadcasting has taken a hit with 501 games in Europe's big five leagues alone, um, being played behind closed doors or cancelled. Uh, it's 27% of the, of the total for the season, which um, applied across the continent would be 1.7 billion euros of domestic, domestic broadcasting deals, um, an equivalent across sponsorship losses, um, if contracts are affected the same way, it would be 1.3 billion. Um, gate receipts, although some may be covered by insurance, this is um, a factor that's likely to hit uh, small clubs and leagues the hardest, who rely on this um, local source of revenue um, uh, most strongly. And uh, revenue from UEFA with 40 Champions League and Europa League games remaining, um, that's 160 million in distributions that uh, would have been lost to clubs if that hadn't been um, eventually brought around to be continuing in August. And transfers, um, obviously with cash flows hit to both clubs and owners, um, maybe we're going to see a, a breakdown in big money moves, um, although there could potentially be clubs trying to offload high wage players um, as their cash flows are pushed. So a closer look on match day revenue. Um, when we were trying to estimate a projected loss for the season, we took the average revenue per game across leagues, ranging from 2 million average in the Premier League to um, half a million in Liga, and these are the, the big five leagues, um, uh, multiplied that by the number of games behind closed doors, and we reached a total of 655 million for just these leagues alone, and that's expected to increase by um, a billion across all of uh, European football. But uh, disparity in broadcasting and sponsorship between leagues leaves some with a much higher dependency on match day. Um, here you can see that uh, although gate receipts make up only 12 to 18% in the big five leagues we've been looking at, they make up 43% of total revenue in Scotland in 2018, um, meaning that that uh, lost revenue is going to leave uh, those clubs with a much bigger hole than um, uh, those leagues that don't depend on those local match day revenues. Um, looking at the Premier League and the Championship in the UK, uh, we can see that Bournemouth in the Premier League earns only 4% of its revenue from match day, um, being res relatively insulated against those uh, games behind closed doors, whereas Leeds, top of the Championship, um, makes up 38% of its revenue uh, from uh, match day. So moving on to the impact on broadcasting, 25% um, of matches across the top five leagues behind closed doors, um, with Premier League clubs already announced to have to pay back a minimum of 330 million to broadcasters, uh, 36 million for each week of the season that's extending behind, beyond the 16th of July, which is probably why we've all been entertained by endless uh, Premier League football being played out over the last few weeks um, to meet that deadline. And it's a similar story in Liga, where the games have been outright cancelled. Uh, in the Premier League, that's a 
reduction in broadcasting revenue for the year. And that's only slightly behind the 24% of games that have been held behind closed doors, uh, showing that there isn't actually too big a gap between the games being played behind closed doors and being cancelled outright in terms of the money being paid back to um, the sponsors. But you can compare that to 28% in, uh, in France, uh, where the cancellations have caused um, even more disruption. Uh, it's also been announced that uh, Li Yingao's new very lucrative deal for starting next year of 1.15 billion euros um, uh, has been said by the owner of uh, Media Pro making that investment that they won't be paying um, that if the games aren't, um, aren't scheduled in the same way. Uh, there have been some positive signs in broadcasting, though. The Southampton versus Man City game on the BBC broke the Premier League TV audience record. Um, and I think some people are suspecting that with the new Premier League schedule for finishing the season with no concurrent games and all broadcast on TV, this could um, break the current restrictions on broadcasting the, the 3 p.m. Saturday games in the UK. Uh, looking at commercial revenue, um, if similar contract clawbacks exist in the uh, sponsorship and um, partnership revenues for clubs, we can expect to see up to 1.25 billion euros um, clawed back in the big five leagues. And, and this is the area that will generate the biggest hit to brand value, as these commercial partnerships are the most brand driven of sports enterprises revenue streams, um, and most dependent on the, the strength of the brand. Um, so these are the ones that will have the um, biggest impact on the brand value of these clubs. Um, so if we look at the proportion of shirt sponsors from each sector, um, we can see uh, the retails at the top with 17% of shirts, um, gambling next, financial services and professional services. However, from the 2019 to 2020 season, 30% of the top division European clubs changed shirt sponsors. Um, so if we look at the business value impact on these different sectors um, between January and March, it leaves you thinking uh, how many of these clubs are going to be able to renew those deals or get new contracts at uh, improved terms to the previous year. Um, finally, a quick look at what might happen to transfer revenues. Total player transfer spend in 2018 reached 8 billion euros, which is more than double the 2014 total just four years ago. Um, however, of course, with cash flows dampened by losses um, uh, in other revenue streams for the clubs, but also owners reluctant to make investments, uh, we could see transfers fall over the summer transfer window. Um, already the world's most valuable player, um, Mbappe, has reportedly had his moves um, from PSG uh, slowed or scuppered by virus issues. And you can see that's already a big hit to the, uh, to the total. However, this is, of course, um, a balancing act. And although transfer spend outweighs income, um, a reduction in transfers wouldn't have too significant a net effect on the, on the brand values of clubs. So how do these effects impact the value of a sports brand? Um, obviously, all these movements working together paint a pretty dark picture from which it can be quite hard to judge how a brand is really performing, especially over the long term. So we use brand valuation as a method to distill the qualitative um, and financial aspects down into two easily understood numbers. So taking Real Madrid as an example, the first one's a brand strength index, um, uh, which is a score out of 100 representing the, the power of the, the brand. And the second is, of course, the brand value. So Real Madrid, top of both those categories, is not only the strongest brand in football, but one of the strongest brands in the world um, and one of the most valuable sporting brands in the world um, at 1.6 billion euros. So how do we get here? There are four steps to building um, a brand valuation analysis. So the first one is calculating the brand strength index. This uses a combination of market research and performance metrics for the brands to understand how they benchmark across the industry um, and understand how that um, strength has been built up by both on-pitch performance, uh, marketing investments, lucrative contracts, um, and of course the heritage of the club. 
The second step is deriving the brand impact of each revenue stream. So this is effectively how important brand is in driving those revenues. So if you compare broadcasting revenue, which might be highly dependent on, in the UK, for example, staying in the Premier League, is um, relies on strong on-pitch performance, whereas commercial revenue through sponsorships uh, relies on a strong brand to bring those partnerships um, through the door. The third step is forecasting revenues. So the future growth of each uh, revenue stream has to be taken into account. And obviously this is one of the areas where COVID has had not just a big effect on the figures in 2020, but also left it wide open in terms of uncertainty as to how growth is gonna look in the future as both the club dependent contracts such as um, player transfers and deals and commercial aspects, but also those organized by the leagues, which is, um, includes the broadcasting deals, which can be hugely lucrative for the clubs as well. And then we combine all these together into the financial valuation, um, which involves baking in the, uh, the financial assumptions, so long-term growth and risk rates, um, and combining that with that financial forecast um, and brand strength. So what's happened this year is 13% um, of brand value wiped off the top 50 European football club brands um, due to the effect of the pandemic. Um, however, despite the huge implications of COVID-19 and sports and their financial results that we've seen in 2020, many of these top 50 clubs across um, leagues all over um, Europe, including Turkish clubs and Portuguese, they're all 50, 60, 100 plus years old, and their brand value exists in the long term. So going back to Real Madrid, only 21% of the brand value is actually delivered by the financials and um, brand results in the next five years, with the rest locked up in the future of the, of the brand. So as long as teams can survive this shock, um, most of them have actually managed to preserve 87% of the, the brand value. So from here, we're going to be going back to deck to explore how COVID-19 may have changed the future of sports. Thanks, Hugo. Um, so what we've done actually is we've touched on, on the brand and business impact on, on clubs and franchises. So now if we look at the other side of the coin, what are the implications for, for corporate sponsors and, and partner brands in the industry? So on this slide here, we've got a, a, a stakeholder map essentially. And I think it's worth noting that sponsorship activities and indeed other marketing activities in general, whilst predominantly directed at consumers, they also have a potential benefit across all other stakeholders. So for suppliers, for example, it can reduce supplier costs or secure uh, better terms with your suppliers. Uh, for staff, there's an opportunity to improve staff engagement levels and uh, make the brand and business more attractive from a recruitment perspective. Uh, a stronger brand can also influence terms amongst financiers and, and regulators in the market. And of course, the attitudes of, of the media and, and broader public in general can be positively influenced by, by a strong brand as well. So how is value created for uh, sponsor brands and partners, and, and what are the implications at each stage of, of value from the onset of, of COVID-19? So the first module we look at is at the inception of the sponsorship, um, and what metrics are key to the sponsor that they want to own in the market is the key question that, that needs to be asked, ans answered by all corporate sponsors when undertaking a sponsorship. How would these particular metrics add value to your particular business? So the implications of the COVID disruption then leads to the question, does the sponsorship still actually make sense in terms of its original objectives in targeting the desired stakeholders? So if you're targeting internal employees with a campaign, for example, how can the partnership be used to create incentives when events are now play, uh, being played behind closed doors? The second module we look at is uh, brand equity perceptions. So first and foremost, sponsorships are there to drive brand awareness and improve brand equity metrics. These metrics that were identified in module one at inception of the sponsorship. 
So the question then is, can the sponsorship still achieve the desired exposure and impact on these brand perceptions under the current circumstances? So the lockdown and the way these uh, games or activities are now being broadcast and not in the original form, we may not necessarily see the positive brand perceptions and brand awareness increases that we would have seen prior to, to the onset of COVID. The third module then is influencing stakeholder behaviors. So ultimately brand, brand perceptions or the change in brand perceptions should lead to a change in uh, stakeholder behaviors in the form of say, increased customer acquisition or decreased customer churn, for example. So the, the question then is uh, you need to consider the changes in terms of the customer ability to actually engage with the brand going forward. So if you are an apparel brand, for example, and you are driving familiarity and consideration and preference for your brand through sponsoring a football team, you still need to ask yourself the question whether given the current climate of lockdown, stakeholders can actually access your brand or not. So if, if your stores are closed on the retail high street, do you have a sufficient online platform to be able to sell your, your goods to those consumers? Then finally, the fourth module, we look at the financial impact in terms of change in revenue and profitability as a result of these changes in customer behaviors. So brands need to ask then, is the marginal benefit of the sponsorship activity outweighing the marginal cost of the sponsorship fees? Are your increased revenues being derived through the sponsorship sufficiently large enough that they outweigh the sponsorship outlay cost in terms of the agreed sponsorship fee to the rights holder, as well as all of the activation spend that goes with that. So what we have done on this slide is uh, we've provided a case study for you from one of our previous clients in which we are attempting to benchmark a sponsorship uh, property versus what else is available in the market. And essentially what we are doing is looking at uh, six variables here. So the first is accessibility, prestige, brand. So this brand image attributes, uh, the reach of the sponsorship, media across other channels, as well as social media. And what we do is try and assess the returns that these brands are obtaining relative to the annual fee that they spend in sponsorship. And what the slide says, if you focus on column one there, on, on brand one, you can see that relative to the rest of the market, brand one was outperforming in terms of what they were spending and what else was available as a property in the market. So they were receiving returns of 140% relative to their annual spend. That is in direct contrast, for example, on the far right hand screen with brand six and on the far right hand side of the screen with brand six and property six, where they only received an 83% return relative to their spend. Now, this can actually change uh, as a result of a change in broadcasting or a reduction in broadcasting. And uh, what we happened to do in, in this case study was that the client happened to experience a reduction in broadcasting. And so we asked which of these metrics are actually impacted by a reduction in broadcasting. And we landed on three of these metrics. So the first is brand image perceptions. So that would likely be impacted due to reduction in broadcasting. The second is overall reach. Uh, and I think that's self-explanatory. And the third is uh, the media segmentation uh, of which we are talking about content creation and the lack thereof due to a lack of broadcasting. So what we could then do is model the negative impacts on these areas and see how that would affect the, wor the worth of the property going forward. So what we found was that there was a 56% reduction in the brand image attributes, a 10% reduction in reach, and an 83% reduction in media, and that's in absolute values. And that then led to a scenario where there was a significant reduction in the overall performance of this property relative to the scenario prior to the reduction in broadcasting. So you can see that the weighted average return was 103%. Uh, and although that is still positive, it's significantly 
uh, below what they had originally bought into. So that's a reduction of, of 37%. So the logical question then is what should corporate sponsors do? And you know, we believe it's increasingly important to measure the return on investment of your sponsorships. So we look at it from inception of sponsorship. So the first step would be evaluating and selecting the correct attributes your brand should own in the market. And perhaps that has now subsequently changed given the, the current scenarios that we are in. And once that is done, it is about selecting the correct sponsorship through brand alignment to achieve these metrics and then effectively activating to make sure that you're meeting the, these goals. This should then lead to improved brand image perceptions. Uh, and this can all be measured through market research. So as you can see on the graph on screen, an increase in brand activation is highly correlated with an increase in brand equity perceptions. Improved brand image perceptions can then be linked to uh, financial metrics and stakeholder behaviors. So uh, things like increased customer acquisition or decrease in, in customer churn, for example. And what we can see on the graph in the middle of the screen is there's a correlation between an improvement in brand equity perceptions and an increase in market share, for example. This change in stakeholder behavior can then be run through a financial valuation model to determine whether there are increased revenues, increased profits, and increased business and brand value as a result of the sponsorship. So what we can see here is that you start with the current value of your business, you spend a certain amount on the sponsorship and on activation, in the hope that you would see a performance up uplift in terms of revenue and profits and an overall increase in business value. And ultimately, if the value of your business is increasing from an activity, that indicates good return on investment. So the, the next question is where to now for both clubs and corporate brands and, and where do we see the landscape shifting and what you should be doing in the future? According to Brand Finance's football research, we are seeing shifting patterns in how fans are consuming football. And probably we think this could be true for sports in general outside of the football industry. So while traditional media is still dominant, we are seeing a rise in social media and streaming services, uh, particularly for fans in emerging markets. So you can see on the right hand side of the screen of United States and, and China, for example. And the question is, could this indicate an opportunity for clubs and sponsors to focus their activation activities more acutely in these areas to generate higher returns on investment in the future? Perhaps there's also further room for innovation across these channels of consumption. Again, according to our research, which was conducted pre the onset of COVID-19, it revealed high engagement levels among younger football fans with regards to both playing and watching esports activities. Uh, so, since the, the onset of coronavirus, it's, it's been reported that esports, I think as Hugo mentioned earlier, which is already a high growth industry, saw a huge surge in numbers, particularly in the first few weeks of, of the onset of, of lockdown activities globally. So, this really is a growth market that clubs and corporate brands should look to tap into. I think another interesting point to note on this graph is again the fact that USA and China are far more engaged in esports than their European counterparts across all age groups. And again, for most of the Western world, the, the USA and China represent huge emerging markets to, to tap into in, in terms of revenue generation. Interestingly, fans of football clubs have also indicated that they are very open to the idea of their teams having an actual esports team. And uh, the likes of uh, PSG and Wolves in the Premier League, for example, they are quite prevalent in this field already with, with successful teams in esports industries across various esports games. And what we're seeing is a trend of more and more teams heading down this route as they try to tap into a wider fan base and diversify their, their revenue streams going forward. And we think that's a particular, particularly important point to mention in that both teams and corporate sponsors should seek to diversify these revenues as far as possible. So I'm now going to hand back to Hugo as we walk you through some, some key recommendations for both sports organizations as well as corporate brands. 
Thanks. Um, so looking back at those sports organizations, that's not just clubs, but leagues um, um, and international organizations as well. The first recommendation is to diversify and broaden revenue streams. Um, this goes beyond just saying make more revenue. Um, this diversification is to insulate yourself against the shocks such as COVID, but not just global pandemics. It could be, you know, the breakdown of a broadcasting contract, the collapse of a investor. Um, all of these things can be countered by having um, keen research and understanding of the different levels of consumption across the um, across your sport, um, and being able to tap into those and drive revenues across um, a more diverse um, set of streams. The second one is keep communicating. Um, maintaining strong relationships with fans, but also other stakeholders. So that's your sponsors and um, either the leagues you operate in as a club or the clubs below you as a league. Um, and that's essential to um, make sure that everyone is on the same page and that you're pulling in the same direction, um, especially during times when big decisions have to be made, such as the restarting of a league. Um, and you're going to have different aspects um, pulling against each other. So communication is key. As we saw with the um, some of the European football leagues, we had player organizations not willing to go back to um, playing until there were suitable measures in place. Um, third, for your current partners, ensure you're delivering the best value proposition possible. So this means access, assess the activations that are possible in the current climate and make sure that you're making an offering um, to your, um, to your sponsors and partners uh, that gives them the best value and means that when the big decisions have to be made over the next few years, um, they want to stay with you and um, you're able to bring in more, um, more lucrative deals. Um, and this, this can be things like, um, you know, giving the partners access to player interviews, coaches, training sessions, or, um, or other you know, productions around the, around the um, organization. The fourth, ensure you're aligning your brand goals when choosing a corporate partner. So this is more relevant than ever. Um, so key to a long relationship um, is obviously a good alignment between the, between the sports organization and the partners. Um, and this, uh, this also insulates you um, against these shocks is you're more likely to be able to hold on to your sponsors and partners uh, through these difficult times because they really see the value and understand you um, as an aligned partner. Um, also, um, well, it's the rising is the spotlight on ethics uh, with global health um, highlighted by the coronavirus pandemic, but also arising through movements such as Black Lives Matter, where you need to make sure that everyone is um, ethically in the right place um, so that you're going to have a strong relationship going forward and there aren't going to be any uh, surprises for you um, because of those issues. And fifth is determine whether you can get more from your current portfolio as a right rights holder and track the level of uplift you can provide for corporate brands. And this ties into all the other points um, and it's about understanding how you add value and are able to um, add value uh, to your rights holders by tracking um, behavioral uplifts, um, perception differences um, in your fans, and then being able to take that to the negotiating table with partners um, so that you can prove what positive effects association with your sports organization is, um, is bringing to them. Um, and back to Declan to look at the other side of the coin. Thanks, Hugo. So, yeah, let's take a look at, at partner brands and corporate brands. So our first recommendation would be to ensure you have identified your, your target audience and assess whether the sponsorship property is the right fit. So, you know, it's important to align your brand with a suitable property so you can, for lack of a better word, borrow their strong brand equity and borrow those image attributes that you've identified. Um, and it's also important just to align and, and make sure that, that that agreement can meet your, your corporate goals. The second recommendation would be to explore all sponsorship assets available in the agreement. Um, so, you know, does your current agreement include uh, access to other sponsorship assets? Um, it's crucial to make sure that 
your brand is getting as much exposure as possible. And if that's not necessarily on, on the front of shirt sponsor, it can be behind the billboard or, or of an interview or on the sideboards during a match. The third recommendation would be to explore all activation channels possible. And I think this is particularly important in the current climate of, of lockdown. And activation is extremely key and effective activation is key. So if you think about particularly shifting money towards activating through digital channels, for example, while um, there's less freedom of, of movement globally, that could see higher returns for your brand. Uh, and lastly, measure return on investment of your sponsorship activities and act accordingly. So it's important to do this measurement regularly and to assess whether a change in any conditions has affected the return the sponsorship is generating for your brand. And this is not just true for sponsorship activities, but we would recommend this for all marketing activities um, and brand campaigns in general. So that's, that's it for our presentation. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone to please feel free to use the Q&A button that you should see. Um, I think presumably it's on the top or bottom of your screen. Just click in that. Um, feel free to, to ask any questions and, and Hugo and I will, will do our best to answer those for you. So thank you very much to Declan and Hugo. Um, and as um, Dec just said, we'd now like to provide the opportunity for our attendees to participate in the Q&A. Um, just before, I'd like to encourage you all to engage with us on social media um, with the hashtag um, BFI webinar and the Brand Finance handle on Twitter um, at Brand Finance. Um, so we've had a few questions through. Um, I'd like to start with uh, the one. Um, when looking at the um, return of investment of existing sponsorships, do you think there's long-term value in being the sponsor that sticks with and supports a team through a difficult time? Um, sure, I'll, I can handle this first and see if Hugo would like to add anything. Um, I think through our research, what we have actually seen, which is quite interesting, is that there is quite a lag effect on sponsorship activities, even if you stop a sponsorship. So we can see years down the line that there's still relatively high recall and familiarity and improved brand perceptions for your corporate brand, even though you may not necessarily um, be the, the sponsorship of, of that property right anymore. So, you know, firstly, um, if you were to, to stop a sponsorship activity, you could still see benefits long term. But I think in the immediate term, uh, in terms of publicity, uh, you know, removing yourself from, from a sponsorship and it's very dependent on, on what that property is, could have negative effects um, on, your, on your reputation in, in the short term. So that's definitely something, something to consider. Do you have anything to add there, Hugo? Um, no, ob obviously that can go both ways. As we saw, um, there's still a huge um, response that Siemens would be a sponsor of uh, Real Madrid, um, but actually that sponsorship shut down when they stopped their consumer operations. So that's one that maybe um, didn't make as much sense as others. Um, but there would obviously be negative effects definitely among the fans if you're seen to be sort of jumping ship um, during COVID, um, especially when competition to win these sponsorship contracts is going to be stronger than ever. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I had another question through. Um, what are the potential implications for corporate sponsorship agreements moving forwards? Yeah, so again, I, I can handle that first. Um, I think they are extremely dependent um, and differ agreement by agreement. So, um, for example, uh, Adidas has a clause with Manchester United where if Manchester United do not make the Champions League for two years in a row, there's a kickback on the amount of money that Adidas paid to Manchester United for that sponsorship agreement. I think what we will see in the future is a scenario where there are um, a lot more stringent clauses written into contract agreements around a change in the product that these corporates are buying into, um, you know, with, with potential for allowing these organizations to, to reduce their sponsorship fee um, or to shorten the, the term of their contract based on the fact that the product that they've bought into could potentially change 
further down the line. And, um, you know, we, we can see that now with the onset of, of COVID for retail brands, um, you know, they've paid for a certain level of, level of exposure. And if that league hasn't continued or has been canceled as a result of COVID, they're not getting that exposure. Um, for other scenarios, for example, where leagues have continued, you know, many high streets around the world are still closed. So even if your brand is achieving a certain level of exposure, you aren't seeing the financial benefits of that. Um, so I do think we will see uh, an inclusion of, of a lot more stringent clauses in, in, in agreements going forward. In fact, sorry, I think the other thing to add there as well, which, which one of Hugo's slides earlier alluded to, is that you know, the football industry or the sports industry specifically in terms of clubs and franchises has negatively, has been negatively impacted, but there's been huge widespread negative impacts on corporate brands. Um, and, you know, sadly, often what we see is when there's a downturn, marketing budgets are the first thing to get cut. So, uh, you know, they, they, in the short term, there would potentially be a reduction in, in commercial spend on these sponsorship agreements and therefore a reduction in revenue for, for the clubs themselves. Lovely, thanks very much for that. Um, another question come through, what, right, um, what can rights holders do to mitigate the loss of revenue from lack of fans in the stadium? Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I think the uh, match day experience in general is, is ripe for, for innovation. And um, some of the partners we work with, such as uh, Burrow Happold, for example, are um, working on ways to increase revenue generation on, on match day events. And I think the Western world or European um, teams in general could learn a lot from the NFL, for example, where a match day event there around the stadium, there, there's a mall and there's a cinema, for example, and it becomes a whole day activity to go visit the stadium and an opportunity for, for consumers to spend money essentially. Obviously, under a scenario of, of COVID and, and lockdown, these match day revenues just, just cannot be recouped. Um, and it just highlights the fact that there's a huge importance, as recommendation one says there on, on that Hugo mentioned earlier, is to diversify and broaden your revenue streams. So for these smaller teams that are so reliant on match day income, they need to really try and find other sources of income. And one way to do that is to strengthen their brand and make sure it's lucrative to, to corporate sponsors, for example. Perfect, thank you. And Hugo, anything else to add to that? Um, no, I'm okay. Okay, um, well, we've actually, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, do you think there will be long-term impacts for sports brands post COVID-19? Well, I think Hugo, you could probably answer that given your um, slide. Yeah, there definitely will be, but I think these won't be in terms of uh, lost revenues or changing contract values. They'll be through changes in the way that clubs make money and um, and about the structure of, of sports. Because um, obviously in the Premier League where these uh, broadcasting deals are so huge, um, I think a lot of people are predicting that um, why should... Uh, Bournemouth get 100 million from Premier League dis uh, broadcasting distributions and Man City only get 140 million last year when all the games on TV in Man City. So I think some uh, clubs and uh, media companies as well are calling for um, these broadcasting to be spread out to um, spread out to the different clubs to run their own as they could potentially increase their their revenues there. So it's it's the way that people access the sports, I think, that will be what changes in the future and not um, not just, you know, a long-term hit that means we never reach the, the level of transfer values as before. I think that will happen, but it will be the money coming in from other streams, so esports as well. Um, that will be uh, what brings us up, back up to that point um, as opposed to just this hit to, to match day and other factors. Anything, Deck? No, I think you've covered it nicely. 
Okay, that's perfect. Well, I actually think um, we um, we're very, very close to 3 p.m. So we'll have to round off the session. Um, so thank you again, um, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers, Declan and Hugo, uh, for the very insightful presentation um, and for the very interesting Q&A discussion. Um, just a note to our participants today, our next webinar is planned for the 5th of August, where we will be announcing the results of our study into the most valuable football brands of 2020. Um, please do keep an eye out for um, invitations for the event and by visiting our Brand Finance Institute website where you will be able to register for the event. Um, and uh, again, um, at the end of this um, webinar session, I'd just like to encourage all of you to complete the survey, um, at, which will pop up at your screens um, at the end. And again, to keep updated with future webinars, do keep an eye on our website and uh, stay tuned for further updates. Um, once again, thank you to Declan and Hugo. Thank you for, um, to all our participants joining us today. And uh, we look forward to hopefully reconnecting with you again on the 5th of August. <laughs>